First of all, Nima, thank you ever so much for agreeing to be interviewed for our oral history project. And the first thing I'd like to ask you is, how did you come to be here in Yorkshire? Um, I came to do a postdoctorate degree on Ma the Canadian writer Margaret Atwood at the University of Leeds. Okay. And where were you born, please? Uh, in South India. Okay. And whereabouts in South India? Well, if you want to be extremely <laughs> precise, uh, in Coog, which is a hill station in the state of Karnataka. Thank you. And can you tell me how your parents came to come to, how you came to come to England, to Yorkshire specifically? Uh, my parents didn't. They actually. didn't? No, I came here as a student. Ah, excellent. And uh, the reason I've stayed on is because I met an exotically named Englishman called Paul Smith, <laughs> who I married. <laughs> Fantastic. So you came here as a student? As a postdoctorate student. A postdoctorate yeah. student. Yes. And why did you decide England? You could have gone. I'm sure there's, there's other places that you could study. Uh, that's because Leeds has a fine tradition in post-colonial and commonwealth literature studies. And uh, my supervisor, my PhD supervisor uh, in, in India, had actually been a visiting professor at the University of Leeds. So there was a network of connections with the School of English. Excellent. Now, may I ask you a little bit about your parents' background in India? What they, what they did for a living and how you grew up and how you came to be interested in English literature, obviously. Uh, my, my mother was a housewife, but extremely interested in both literature and the fine arts. Uh, my father was absolutely in love with English literature, so some of my bedtime reading included Anna Karenina and Charles Dickens when I was a child. Um, he worked in sericulture, which is the silk industry. Uh, so, and that is quite a thriving uh, government-based industry, particularly in South India. Okay. And um, so that is their background, and that's how I suppose, you know, my, 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 I can't remember a stage in my life when I wasn't in love with literature. And was it always your ambition to study English literature and Carry on. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, uh, I was also interested in the visual arts and also in history, but not quite in the same depth because all my degrees are in English literature and the other subjects have come in, particularly history, have come in as uh, subsids. Mm -hmm. uh, but my father also had a very interesting collection of copies of English paintings, uh, you know, prints, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and engravings and so on, uh, Gainsborough and Turner. And I used to pore over them again and again and again. So I think my fascination with the visual arts must have started then. And it seems to me that it is quite uh, interesting uh, that my first love was with English literature and with English art, British art. But having said that, I st also studying Indian history, which completely riveted me. And through that, I came across Ananda Kumaraswamy, a geologist turned art historian. And he, of course, is supposed to be the, 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 the father of the history of Indian art in terms of scholarship on the history of Indian art. So there was that par parallel development as so well. So this parallel has been going on sort of as soon as you could sort of take these things in? Yes, and yes, these things. yes. Interesting that you mentioned Gainsborough and Turner. These are the romantics. So yes, yeah. Obviously, and again, if you're reading sort of English literature from that period, these are putting faces to... Oh, I, I wasn't just reading the romantics. I was very fond of the precursors to the romantics, like William Blake, for instance. And the fact that he was both a poet and such a wonderful artist. Because uh, a, a French priest, uh, I went to a convent school, and we seemed to know a lot of nuns and priests for some reason. And a French priest had given me some a wonderful... Um, color plates of ba Blake's drawings and engravings. So that was another source of fascination. Plus, of course, Indian miniatures. Of course, yes. 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 So you've had this wonderful parallel background that's been there all your life. Yes, I didn't see it as parallel. I saw it as normal. Mm -hmm. A lot of my friends were similar. 
truthfully, um, you know, particularly middle class India, we were all told that uh, our houses had to be modeled. You know, the English always had en suites. You know, they had lots of bathrooms and uh, everything was done to a certain standard. And I was astonished when I came to Yorkshire <laughs> that houses seemed to be, you know, even four story houses had one bathroom and a lot of people talked with quite nostalgically to my intense astonishment about having an outdoor uh, 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 toilet. So I was quite surprised at that. I wasn't actually surprised at the accent as some of my other Indian contemporaries were because they were more used to the cut class accents of the South. Yes. Uh, so that was one thing. And um, I s but the friendliness took me aback because I came expecting great reserve. And what I got was immense friendliness. Well, we are known up here in the north for being friendly. That yes. Is, that is part of the differences between north and south, that we like to think that we are friendly. Yes. And a lot of friends who've come up from the south have said, my God, you are. You're so friendly. Very friendly, very helpful. Because, um, you know, as someone who's not used to, uh, I felt I knew Britain in one way. I felt I knew England in one way through the literature and through the arts, if you like. And that's quite a disconcerting experience because you have that profound, well, inner awareness, I think. Uh -huh. And then, you, you're, then you know, coming up against the actual reality. And, and, and so that's quite an interesting process because I think some of the, the English people I came across were also disconcerted by the fact that I had this background <laughs> in English literature and, and seemed to know strange things that belong to the 19th century or the 18th century, yes. you know. Yeah. Uh, but I think I was taken aback by the extreme friendliness and helpfulness. And the weather? <laughs> I had been prepared for the weather because, uh, you know, some of my friends told me that as soon as they stepped off the plane, their lips had cracked with the cold. <laughs> and since that didn't happen to me, I decided it was a much balmier climate <laughs> than I had expected. You might have been lucky. Might have been lucky. <laughs> Someone in the uh, University of Leeds asked me if I would be interested in running a program on the history of Indian art in the adult education centre in Bradford. Mm -hmm. So so that happened. Uh, I, I was lucky in the sense that I very quickly, you know, sort of uh, uh, just before I got married, if you like, yes. in 83, that's when I got married, that that happened. And I instinctively knew that, that perhaps the visual arts was where my career was going to go rather than English literature. Though I managed to sort of keep both interests very much you know, alive. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing that. And then I was also offered a post to run a program uh, with um, uh, young Asian people in Bradford. Uh, and I could devise a program any way I liked. So I, I chose literature <laughs> and the visual arts and got to know the community really well. I only did that job for 10 months. Okay. So I, was, I had this part-time job. Mm -hmm teaching the adult education thing on the history of Indian art and, and bringing in elements of Commonwealth and post-colonial literature where it was yes. appropriate. Yes. And then I was also doing this full-time job, which was funded, as I remember, but with European money, and um, made great friends. There were a lot of young Asian men, young Asian Muslim men, and you know, developed a, a very warm relationship with them and also got to know the grassroots community as a result over that 10-month period. And then this job came up at Cartwright Hall, looking for a curator. So moving on to your, your job as a curator. So mm -hmm. there you are, you have this job, you move to the, to the museum side. Yes. And reading your bio, you were in charge, it says, building up their collections. Mm -hmm. So had you, ever, had you bought before? Had you actually been... Not, um, not on that thing? scale, not on that scale, but I have always been, I have always loved shopping. And, um, so, you know, acquisitions come dressed up with, you know, with a yes. particular framework, etc. Yes. But at the end of the day, it was fantastic. Oh, well, when I saw that, I mean, when I was <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, Fant like shopping. <laughs> fantastic shopping. Yes. Uh, basically, uh, you know, we had a very enlightened team, particularly the head of museums, Paul Lawson, who I would like to pay credit to. Any good idea, he'd say, just go and do it. 
So it became like an intellectual playground, you know, as long as I could raise the money. So I realized if I had a good idea and if I could raise the money, they'd always put in a bit of seed money. And, uh, you know, so that, that, that was good. And everyone seemed quite keen to support it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it so was, were they, was it a large collection? There was no collection when I started. Really? No, no. They had, okay, I lie. They had one Balraj Khanna painting and uh, they had a, a, a sculpture uh, by an artist whose name currently I can't quite remember and six folk paintings from the Mithila, you know, they're called Mithila paintings. And that, that was it. it was, I think one of the reasons I got that job was because I had the, the sort of the theoretical background, you know, of, of, yes. of, of yeah, the, the history of Indian art and an interest in contemporary Indian art because that was also important to Bradford. So this is they wanted to have a somebody who a representative yeah. collection. Uh, well, I don't think they thought, thought in that detail. They just wanted somebody to come and do something vivid and vibrant, which is great. <laughs> That's the way you yes. should do it. But also the fact that through running that program, I had grassroots connections in Bradford yes. and that to me has in, been invaluable throughout that you know uh, it, it's having one hopes uh, programs of excellence but also then being able to provide access to that excellence amongst very disparate groups of people. Okay. So did you turn to them for actually acquisitions or? No what we did was was great fun because I remember I was appointed in November and that was cold and grey. What year was that? Just in 1985, okay. yeah. And, uh, and I remember that in December I called a consultation meeting uh, and I said to Bradford, we need to um, you know, make sure that this is a hospitable setup. So food was laid on. And I'm very proud of the fact that the first group to approach me, and indeed I did do an exhibition, was the Ukrainian community. Uh, they had uh, you know, an Ukrainian artist uh, who's famous in Ukraine, in the Ukraine, and they wanted us to curate a show. And I did that in the following year. Excellent. Yeah, but in this um, consultation meeting, we managed to get, I mean, about 65 people turned up, representatives of different communities, and I said, you know, this is my vision, but I want this vision to be informed uh, by, you know, your thoughts. And I also want you to go along, you know, go with me on this quest. It is exciting. Um, I'd be delighted if you could tell me what you would like to say, but please don't tell me what you don't want to see, because therein lies perhaps censorship and treading on other people's feet. And because it was such a pleasantly neutral and creative arena, they were very mindful of, you know, they were Sikhs, they were Hindus, they were Muslims, but they were quite mindful of other people's interests. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but also I was looking at contemporary art and that was a very exciting period, still continues to be, but in terms of the emergence of what's called black art, for lack of a better term, what uh, artists of Asian and African and Caribbean descent were producing, you know, people like Shitapa Bishwas, Salim Arif, um, Keith Piper, Eddie Chambers, that was all fascinating stuff and I recognized the importance of capturing that aspect of British history because right no other galleries were collecting. Right at the beginning. Yeah. Right. I've, I've, I've always been interested in it. I call it confluence of cultures. And um, as my, you know, because I was appointed primarily to build up the Asian collections, to, to do exhibitions and increase the number of Asian visitors to the gallery. Uh, but I began to, mo you know, once you've had a few things that have worked well, then you're in a very strong position uh, to, to, to change direction, to widen it, yes. and so on. And yes. that's precisely what I did. Yes, I was head of special projects at the National Media Museum. And for two years, so that so was a special project. Was that? I'll give you an example. Uh, I was a project directing uh, the the coming of a BBC Radio into the very heart of the museum, and so I was working with the BBC on that process, and it was fascinating because it was two cultures coming together. And I remember saying to the National Media Museum staff, you know, you're going to make friends with them you're going to go, you know, drinking together and so on. But remember, you still have to be careful in, in, in terms of how these friendships pan out because when there is news, they have to be completely impartial. But we may not look at it, you yes. know, in quite the same way. But that was a, a, a fantastic project, 
uh, to, to, to oversee. And also, um, I fundraised uh, monies from both uh, Yorkshire Forward, as it was, and uh, various other bodies to help with, because the museum had just acquired the Royal Photographic Society collections. And that is such an important historic and modern collection that in one stroke it made the holdings of the National Media Museum one of the most significant in the world. So, you know, so, so there was a whole project there that needed embedding. Well, I had worked for the Arts Council just short of four years and I'd worked for the National Media Museum just f over two years and I had learned a lot from both jobs but I thought it would be it was high time I went back to being a creative full time. And that's uh, why I set up Alchemy because I thought I can curate ideas, I can broker partnerships, I can work with a whole range of partners. And what was lovely about that was my three previous employers all gave me the most fantastic support. Uh, Bradford Museums and Galleries through Jane Glaster and Mark Suggett said, go for it. You, you want to completely revision the top floor and you know, uh, talk about the confluence of cultures. It's a challenging framework, but we are behind you and we will work with you and Alchemy can project direct that. So to have that, you know, just when I was thinking about Alchemy, it was wonderful. Uh, the National Media Museum, uh, the then acting director, Tony Sweeney, also gave us an 18-month contract to work on one of their projects. And the Arts Council, we had said, you know, we are in the, uh, the process of setting this company up, uh, had long discussions with us, and, and um, you know, we were tantamount to regularly funded. So we had... I have to say, throughout my working life, a lot of professional support from a whole range of people, from grassroots uh, to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. So what sectors. is Alchemy currently involved in? Well, Alchemy is currently involved in uh, doing, uh, you know, researching a project called Love Beyond Measure, The Legend of Sony and Mahawal. It is one of the great love stories of India and uh, the internationally acclaimed artist Arpana Kaur has dedicated the last 15 years, not solely, but she has produced a whole range of paintings around this love story, which like all love stories has a doomed ending. But what is interesting about the Sony and Mahawa legend is that uh, the romantic and the spiritual edges are blurred. Because when Sony is swimming across the river and she knows she's going to drown, she says, I cannot turn back because I promised him that I will meet him. And therefore, I will be betraying love itself if I turn back. And that then taps into Sufi thinking. And so they say, a love so profound means it is transcended into spiritual love. And that's why the legend of Sony and Mahawal are very dear to the Sufi poets. And Arpana Kaur has done a whole range of interpretations around this, magnificent ones. So we're going to do a massive online thing, complete with interpretations, interviews. She's given us, uh, as her contribution, the most wonderful stock of high-resolution images with copyright clearance. But in that process, we will also look at the great love stories of Tristram and Isilt, the one that actually happened, uh, Abelard and Eloise. And but you're Anna Karenina. And that Anna Karenina, absolutely. Another big project, and that would be you know, a, a longer project, is Albion, British Identity Through the Looking Door. Oh, Blake, back to your... Well, actually, Blake hasn't figured yet, but back there is time. Well, there is time. Albion's there is time. Blake, yes, it? absolutely. Well, that's where we got yes, the name. Yes. I mean, the name is older than that. Yes. But it is a name that's used by the Scottish and the Welsh yes. as well. And probably all the names for Britain and England are contentious. This is probably and the, the least. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And that, again, you know, allows us to look at. And so that would be a northern wide project if we get the money for it. And we've already had an initial workshop uh, talking to Beads World Jarrow Bead yes. as in the venerable bead yes. uh, we're talking to Opera North uh, we're talking to Hull Council okay. yeah and we're talking to Barnsley Civic and um, you know some of the things we're looking at is the haunting which is the ghost stories of Montague Rhodes James and how we make that into an immersive 
visual arts experience and we're also looking at uh, the northeastern glass because of course allegedly the first piece of stained glass was found in, in Jarrow and uh, also archaeological dig recently found shards of glass which they attribute to Roman and Islamic glass so we thought you know and glass being quite a mystic mystical force yes. uh, we, we thought we'd do a project called the seduction of glass yeah so cross-culturalism or conference of cultures or transculturalism may be new as an intellectual discipline yes but it is not yes. new to us in our everyday lives yes and across think, the world I think people forget this yes. i think people do forget that yeah that, that this has been going on for yeah. literally thousands yeah thousands of years yes yes yes, yes. well may yours projects not going on for thousands of years. No, 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 no. You no. seem to have a fair bit to keep you going. Subject to the funding, but then, you know, that's always the case. <laughs> of course it has changed. Of course it has changed. It would be uh, strange if it hadn't yes. changed. Yeah. And, you know, I think the expect things have got much tighter. Uh, but it's also, I think, made us more, uh, you know, forced us to be much more focused. And we have to demonstrate time and again value for money. And I don't think that's entirely a bad thing, to be honest. You know, we're very lucky to be in a sector that's relatively subsidized. You know, we are very proud that we also have earned income. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a privilege. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is a privilege we should never take lightly. And it's a privilege that's going to be increasingly more difficult to tap into. You just have to make sure that, you know, the work is good and that there are you know enough audiences engaging with it. But do you think there is a bit of a cultural shift? I mean Ferenc Art Gallery in Hull is just one East Riding visitor attraction of the year mm. for an art gallery. Now do you think that there has become far more interest? Do you think the interest is, is growing among ordinary people oh def uh, definitely amongst the grassroots the, I think the interest has always been there but they may not have always found the right hook or the r right kind of welcome even mm -hmm. even though everyone is well intentioned yes. but perhaps not mediate you know it's not been mediated in the correct way however both with established and grassroots new emergent audiences you can't ever uh, be in a state of complacence. It needs continual nurturing. You can't have an offer that does not change. And that does take resources. Yes. And that is the challenge. Yes.